All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to coming. Welcome to your interview with astronaut Pam Melroy. Pam, thank you so much for taking your time today to talk to our junior test pilots. They have lots of questions, and I'm so glad that you've taken the time to give them the answers. So, well, thank you. It's my pleasure to be here, and I'm excited to talk to anybody who's interested in flight tests and in space. That's always great. So, Pam, you were a commander of the space shuttle two times, correct? Uh, I commanded once. I flew twice as a pilot in the right seat, and then my third mission, I was the commander. Awesome. This week, the student's lesson was on payload. So they learned a lot about how and why we have to consider payload when designing aircraft. And they did a whole unit on the space shuttle and how the space shuttle was developed to basically support the building of the International Space Station and that it's cargo bay. So they analyzed how the 747 was modified to take the space shuttle back and forth while in the, the troposphere um, and how the 747's payload needed to be modified to carry the space shuttle and then why they had to analyze the space shuttle and how it needed space in it to, build, to bring all the materials up and the satellites. The one thing that we didn't see was the when building this, the International Space Station, were the panels brought up and the astronauts needed to construct the different sections, or were those sections mostly built and then delivered? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, to, to the greatest extent possible, you want to do all the construction on the ground. And so we did do that. Um, but there's a lot of things that, um, the, the final things that can't be done except in space. And of course, the space station was way too big to take up uh, in one piece. You can't fit it either. On, there's no rocket heavy enough to lift the whole thing. And even if there were, um, there's no, there's usually a, a, what's called a fairing or a nose cone over the rocket and the payload sits inside there. And uh, so that, that was what was special about the space shuttle, being able to put it in the back. But what was really special was being able to take the robotic arm, which was capable of lifting very large objects in microgravity, moving it into position. We had a couple ways of attaching. One is a ring of bolts that you could actually command from inside the sh uh, shuttle or the, the space station um, that would cinch the two pieces down. And uh, that was called the common berthing mechanism. Um, but in some cases, uh, it literally had to send a spacewalker out to do the bolts to connect two pieces together. And um, the solar arrays in particular, I think that that was a question. They came up all squished, like almost like, a, you know, the way Venetian blinds go up to the top and then you pull a cord and they uh, unfold like an accordion. Um, it's a little more complicated than that, but that's essentially how the solar arrays were taken to space because they're, they're huge. Um, they're uh, each, each wing itself is 90 meters long, and then there's the big section in the middle. And uh, so between the, the, the two. So, um, so yeah, we, we would get as much done as possible, and then we would have to attach it. Um, in the case of the solar arrays, we would unfurl it. Uh, and then we would send spacewalkers out to make the electrical cooling, um, other kinds of connections because the robot arm didn't have the dexterity of a spacewalker to do those final connections. It kind of makes sense if you think about building a, a new section of your house. Um, first you frame it up and attach it, but then you have to lay all the electrical and all the cabling and things like that before you can actually live in it. Um, but it was, you know, as, as, as much as we could possibly do before we got in space. Another interesting part about that is that every time we added a piece of the space station, we had to completely change the software of the space station, right? Because now it is different mass properties. It's got new pieces on it and new command paths and things that have to be done. 
And so that was pretty complicated even all by itself. That's awesome. It was actually really fascinating for me to put together this module. Um, I got to go way more deeply into all of the aspects of just how difficult it was to build the International Space Station because it's, it, it's fascinating and you wonder, one wonders, wow, that is really amazing and how did they do that? But when you really get into the details, like, wow, that is an amazing feat that it was done at all. So thank you for your service to our country and for contributing so much over the course of your career and your lifetime. Um, with that, I am going to pass over to Kaylee Sandberg. Would you like to ask your question for Astronaut Pam? Yeah. Um, so what was the most interesting thing you either learned while you were in space or that you did while there? Uh, yeah, that's a great question, Kaylee. I think, um, you know, interesting falls into a lot of different categories. There's um, uh, fun and um, hard and surprising and all those things happen um, in, in space uh, because, you know, especially as we were constructing the space station, we never actually put the whole thing together on the ground. So once we got on orbit, we had to, you know, we hoped things would work out. On my third flight, when we went to unfurl a solar array uh, after locating it into its final position, it ripped. And that was not something that anybody had planned for. It wasn't anything we practiced for. Believe me, we practiced for every emergency we could possibly think of. Um, but you can't, can't imagine everything that's going to happen. So that was a big surprise for us. And um, so there were a lot of um, uh, constraints and maybe let's call them rules things that you do for either safety or for operations or just so you don't break the hardware. And so what we had to do is we had to figure out within all those rules, uh, were there some that we could uh, do things differently and maybe solve this problem? Um, it was pretty dangerous. Um, so uh, we figured out the ground, you know, planned this and we worked together with them. And after about three days of planning, we went out on an emergency spacewalk. My lead spacewalker and another spacewalker went out and um, my lead spacewalker stitched up the solar array to give it structural integrity so we could finish deploying it. And, um, and he saved the space station, our crew did. So that was probably the most surprising thing that happened. <laughs> Awesome. All right. Cody, would you like to ask your question? When was the longest day in space? The longest day? Oh, I think wow. That was his long, longest stay. Longest stay. Oh, longest stay in space. Yeah, my, my last flight we had to extend because of the spacewalk. So I stayed in space 16 days. All three of my missions were on the space shuttle, and the space shuttle can stay in space about uh, 16 or 17 days at the absolute maximum. And in fact, you have to kind of preserve some of your resources in order to do that. So we had to do things like that. We shut down some systems and then took power from the space station to allow us to stay up a little extra uh, to do that. Cool. All right. Lexi, you're up. <laughs> What, um, when you're in space, what is the thing you miss most about Earth? Oh, that's a great question, Lexi. I think everybody misses their family the most. Um, it's, um, it's, I mean, it's just, you're, you realize how hard it is to get into space and how hard it is to come home. And it can make you feel far away. Um, but I think other than your family, um, there's a couple of things. Um, the first one would be um, taking a shower. <laughs> uh, you, you, there's no shower aboard the space station or the space shuttle. And so you do what's called take a sponge bath. You take a washcloth and you get it wet. And then you, you know, kind of scrub 
and then you squirt a little soap on it and you kind of scrub and I mean you can keep yourself clean that way but it doesn't feel as great as it does to take a bath or get in the shower. Um, we have special kinds of food um, because everything's floating in microgravity so a lot of the food is very sticky so that it stays on a spoon because you don't want it floating away. Um, there are some crackers and things like that but they're all just big enough to pop into your mouth so that there's not crumbs that float away. Um, so you sort of miss some of your favorite foods, like really sloppy foods like pizza and hamburgers, or really crunchy food like a real fresh green salad or popcorn. Uh, and uh, finally, I think probably the other thing that people miss the most is just the ability to take, the, take a walk and smell the air, smell the flowers and, and the grass and, um, and just, we take it for granted. All right. Um, Hunter, would you like to ask your question now? Uh, yes, I would. Uh, my question would be, what is the easiest uh, part in being in microgravity and what was the hardest part in being in microgravity? Well, the easiest part is uh, that everything's floating. It takes very little energy for you to move yourself around in space. You can move yourself around just by pushing with a finger and it would move your whole body. Uh, and so your muscles and your heart and everything are taking a vacation. So the easiest part is, is to get around and, you know, if you and I were having lunch together and I wanted to pass you the salt, I would just, just with my finger, push it over to you and you would catch it. So it makes it pretty easy. Um, <laughs> I would say the hardest part about being in microgravity is using the bathroom. It is, um, it's, uh, I won't say scary, <laughs> but uh, especially for um, the first time, but even, you know, for a commander especially because you know, it's, it's really important for health and safety to stay clean. And when everything floats, you really have to manage everything. You don't want anything to get away from you, whether it's dirty toilet paper or worse, uh, floating around. And so you have to be extremely careful. And um, I think that was one of the things I always talked to my rookies about um, before flying was, okay, just letting you know, plan at least 15 minutes to go to the bathroom, maybe 30. Uh, you just have to be very slow and careful. It is something that I had never thought about until like a couple weeks ago. <laughs> Not for the faint of heart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of my uh, one of my friends that I flew on my first flight with uh, told me that he said um, he said everything is more fun in space except that. <laughs> All right, Maximum, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yes. What do you think the funnest part of space was that uh, you were in? Like, what what was the funnest thing you did in space? What was the most fun thing I did in space? Yeah. Uh, my most fun, most favorite thing to do in space. Well, okay, I, I really do, did love doing, seeing how many somersaults in a row I could do, um, but really the most fun thing was actually to look at the earth. You could float in the window. Um, I like to put my earphones on and listen to music and watch the world roll by underneath me. It's so amazing and so beautiful and it's always changing. And the, the, you go around the earth once every 90 minutes. And so every 45 minutes, there's either a sunrise or a sunset, which changes everything. And of course, you're zooming. I mean, you're going from, you know, across the entire United States in about 15 minutes. Okay. Thank you for your question, Maximum. All right, Matthew, what would you like to ask? How does the day go normally in space? It's a really good question. Um, so uh, the time is not exactly aligned with where your family is. 
Uh, there uh, was a strategy that we used on the space shuttle that we counted the time from liftoff. Um, but the space station, because there's a control room in Moscow and in Japan and in Canada and in Houston, um, there's sort of a compromise. And, um, and so, you know, you're not getting up at the same time as like, for example, your family on the ground is, is getting up. Um, on the space shuttle, we would start our day with wake up music. The, uh, our families would pick a song uh, and everybody would get a turn throughout the mission and you would wake up to the sound of a song being played uh, uh, over the radio from the ground uh, to you from your family. Um, then uh, we had about an hour and a half to roll up our sleeping bags, uh, get everyone through the bathroom, uh, to take a quick shower or, you know, sponge bath, uh, and then feed everyone um, breakfast. And then usually the activities uh, started, started right away. In, in practice, what we did was we divided up tasks. And um, if you're going out on a spacewalk, it's a really super busy day with a long procedure and a lot of things that um, you want to have organized and ready. And so on a spacewalk morning, I would just say, shoot, go off. And the spacewalkers would work on getting their tools ready. They would um, get themselves organized in the airlock. And then I would bring them breakfast, right? So that, that they could be as busy, you know, as effective as possible. Um, a spacewalking day is a really long day. It takes several hours to safely depressurize the airlock, get out the door. Uh, usually about six hours spacewalk and then a few hours uh, to finish, to come back in, get repressurized out of your suit and all those things. Um, it, you know, every day was different for us on the space shuttle. We were building the space station and things had to happen in a certain order. You had to obviously lift something out of the payload bay and attach it to the station before you could send a spacewalker out to make connections. So each day had, had a series of things going on. On the space station today, they're doing science. And so some things have to be done at a certain time, like uh, perhaps if you're over a specific ground station. But actually most of the time, they just give you a list of things that they want you to do during the day. And then you can organize your day however you want, which is, which is nice. I think that's that's nice in space to be able to, to do that. Um, one very important thing to do in space because your body's taking a vacation and it's gonna, and it finds it very hard. Your body struggles when you come back into gravity. Everybody has to work out every single day. So, uh, but we do try to eat the first meal and the last meal of the day together as a crew. I think that's really important. That's when we, would talk things over, both how things went on that day and what you were going to do the next day. Lunch was, well, whenever it comes to you, <laughs> so <laughs> kind of busy. But it, they are fun days because, because every day is a little different. Awesome. And I actually, along those lines, um, so this was from Matthew Kendall and Luke. How long did you need to train in order to become an astronaut? Well, just like being a test pilot, um, you know, you're always studying. Uh, you really have to, as a pilot, you have to make sure that you're reviewing procedures and the systems of your, your aircraft. You really need to understand them. And uh, if you're not practicing it every day, you can forget some of the little things. Um, so uh, the, the normal uh, course of being selected as an astronaut is that you have a college degree uh, in some kind of science, technology, engineering, or math, and then you go off and have a career. And the normal age to be selected is about 10 years after college. And so you have to go off and, and do something else. And I, I was a tech pilot and then a test pilot. So for me, that was also preparing me to be an astronaut. Basic astronaut training is about two years long, and that just gets you very familiar with all of the shuttle and the space station, it will shuttle at my time, and the space station systems. And uh, then you continue to practice 
and you have a job, um, usually helping other astronauts prepare to go to space. Uh, maybe you'll sit in mission control and talk to a crew, that's called CAPCOM. And then uh, once you get assigned to a specific flight, you'll spend about a year and a half to two years training for that flight. And, uh, you know, I think you just have to, you have to be ready always uh, to be training all the time. Uh, but, you know, about the fastest I've ever seen anybody get to space was um, about uh, two and a half years after being selected. And that was really fast. Awesome. Um, yeah, that is really fast. I, yeah. the, the folks that we know, it, it's taken quite, quite a bit of time. Yeah. Yeah. It's different now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> way different, right? Um, okay, from Sophie Nguyen, who is here today, and happy birthday, Sophie. Um, it's also Lexi's birthday. Happy birthday, Lexi. So we have two birthday, young ladies Lexi in the class. Sophie. Yeah. And Sophie would like to know, what does space smell like to you? Mm, yes, to me. Um, well, so my, my, my um, view of the smell of space is affected by having um, been a spacewalk coordinator on my second flight. So my job was uh, to sit inside the airlock um, and help the spacewalkers put their suits on and I would run the systems to, uh, once I got them into the airlock itself, close the hatch, and then I would depressurize it, and then and I would repressurize it, and then open the hatch. And that's when you smell space, because um, you know the, the suits and everything in the airlock has been exposed to space for hours. And so when you open that hatch, um, the smell to me was like an ozone smell, a little bit sharp. Um, uh, you know, you guys uh, probably know the smell of the desert uh, after rain, kind of a creosote, ozone sort of smell, and that's what it smelled like to me. Cool, and Cody had another question. Cody, would you like to answer, um, answer your question? Did you crave for food that wasn't available in space, and have you ever been in the cupola module? Good, good questions. Um, you know, I, I, it wasn't that bad. I mean, there, I did miss, I love popcorn and fresh salad, and those were the things I missed the most. Um, but the food is actually pretty good. They work really hard to make things tasty because that's a, a long time to go um, not liking food. And it's even longer if you live on, on, on station for six months. Uh, so, um, Actually, typically I was excited about uh, when dinner time came around and the only thing is sometimes you're just not in the mood, uh, but guess what? Astronauts do exactly the same thing that kids do in a cafeteria. We look at what we have and then we say, can I trade? <laughs> can I trade my brownie for your, uh, your cherry cake dessert? And, um, and, and so I didn't, I didn't really, I missed uh, green crunchy things the most, but um, I'm sorry, the other question was? Have you ever been in the cupola module? Oh, in the cupola. The cupola went into space just two flights after my last mission, so I didn't get to go inside, which is too bad because uh, it's pretty amazing. The space shuttle has really large windows, and what was interesting when we were docked to the station is that the station crew members would come over to the shuttle to look out the window. Um, so I feel like I have a little bit of a sense of it, but the cupola is really special. So I, I wish I'd gotten to see that, but I didn't. Maybe, maybe you'll get a chance. All right, and we have one more from Lexi, and then we are going to turn over to our flight test attendants, Lexi. You're up. What is it like to like just be in space? Uh, it's, it's super fun. I mean, it, it is like a little bit like being magic because you float and you can push yourself around just with a fingertip. You can lift really big objects. You can do as many somersaults in a row as you can stand without getting your head all dizzy. Um, so 
you you feel things that you don't feel here on earth well, what that means is that especially when you return to earth it almost feels like you went to a different universe uh, where you were magic and could do things that you can't do here um, so you know to me that that was the strongest feeling i had in space was that it was a, that it was like being in a magic world very cool all right so i'd like to introduce you to melody and andrew andrina they are our palmdale aero academy flight test attendants and they will be taking over wonderful nice to thank meet you, you all hi <laughs> um so um a question you know um but i'm like okay um when did you first become interested in planes and engineering? Uh, well, I've always been fascinated by the sky. And my dad was in the Air Force. I wasn't, um, I was more interested in being an astronaut. And when I was your age, all the astronauts I knew about were test pilots. So I decided I was going to go be a test pilot too, even though I didn't really understand what that meant. Uh, and uh, so once I decided that I was going to be a test pilot, I got excited and started studying and learning everything I could about airplanes. So that was somewhere in high school where I started trying to understand and study airplanes and, um, and you know, get to know a little bit about them. Of course, I, I didn't get to be a pilot until I went into the Air Force. question we have for you is why do you think you were interested in pursuing a career in aerospace? I was really inspired by watching the Apollo landings. So when I saw, um, you know, not just the first landing, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Mike Collins, who stayed in the command module, when I saw them go to the moon, uh, but the subsequent Apollo astronauts too. I, I liked um, science. I liked the idea of being an explorer. And like I said, I've always been really fascinated by the sky. Uh, so I studied planetary science um, and uh, astrophysics. And uh, my master's degree is in planetary meteorology because I think weather is cool too. So um, I, I just, I think that's, you know, to me, that's what inspired me. But as I look back, what, what I felt was uh, I wanted to do something that I thought was important and uh, would benefit everyone. And I think exploration um, and science is, is learning new things for the whole human race. And so that, that really inspired me was the idea that, that we could solve problems. Hi. <laughs> um, Hi. So I have my own question and it was going to be um, throughout like high school and college, the classes that you took, did those influence your career path? Um, I think so. I, I uh, you know, I, to me, I just knew that it was really important that I could take um, all the science classes possible. We didn't have engineering classes when I was in high school. Um, that was literally, I mean, I was in high school in the early 70s. And uh, so they had all the science classes. So I took biology and physics and, and chemistry uh, and advanced math. Um, but there was really no opportunities. I mean, today there are high school students out there who are building computers and building CubeSats and doing stuff like that. Um, I think uh, those things would uh, have a really big impact. I can tell you in college, um, although I was really, really, uh, I really enjoyed my classes, when they really started to make sense was when I took summer jobs and internships where I would begin to see, hey, this isn't just a math problem that I'm, I'm proving that I can solve this equation. Um, you know, I was asked to do things like write computer programs using those equations and to uh, study data that we were taking from telescopes um, and, and you know, do things like that and actually say, 
Well, I think I just proved this uh, from looking at the, at the data and doing the math. And so to me, that's when it really came together. So I, I really encourage you. I mean, I'm glad you're doing um, Junior Test Pilot Program. I think it's a great example of how you can see how it all fits together. And it's not just a classroom exercise. Uh, so for the, the times that were the most um, profound learning for me was, was actually usually in the summer. So I have, well, there's a question from Abigail and Alyssa, and they asked, when you were growing up, what was your favorite class? Oh, uh, yeah, my favorite class was, it was usually science. I just really liked science classes a lot. Um, but believe it or not, you know, I love English too. I love to read. I read a lot. I read every day. And um, I like fiction, sometimes science fiction, but other kinds of fiction too. And, um, and I like writing. And so to me, I think uh, English and science were my two favorite. Um, a question from Shirayan's um, Zara Jula. How different is it to fly in space um, compared to uh, an aircraft? Ah, that's a really good question. It is extremely different. Now on the space shuttle, uh, we did come back in and land the shuttle like an aircraft. And so uh, that last few minutes of a two week long flight uh, did have a lot of close comparisons to landing an airplane. Of course, the shuttle had no engines that worked in the Earth's atmosphere. And so you're really actually a glider um, and you had one chance to, to make the landing. Um, but the skills that you get as a pilot, judging how, you know, where you are, the speed, if you're drifting, um, the winds and things like that, um, that last little bit was very much like flying an airplane. Um, but like, for example, docking to the space station, um, there are little thrusters at right angles all over the shuttle. And so I actually had, uh, I did have a, a, an attitude controller that looks like the stick of an airplane, but we hardly ever used it. What we did was we got the two vehicles in the exact right orientation towards each other. And then we froze that, that relative orientation. And then I just moved in and out, left and right, up and down. And I, I had a, uh, like a camera that was pointing up out of the payload bay at a target on the space station. And I would just use those tiny thrusters to move in different directions to line up that target so that we docked perfectly. That's really different um, than flying formation in an airplane. Uh, and it's, you know, of course, you don't have wings uh, in, well, you don't have air in space that's going over the wings. And so your control surfaces are actually little thrusters instead of the air rushing over the vehicle. So the next question I have for you is, you know, what kind of special training do you have to go through be, to, you know, become an astronaut? Uh, yeah, a lot of really interesting training, actually. Um, uh, you know, things that you would never think about. I mean, you, you probably assume that we sat in the simulator and practiced takeoffs and landings and docking to the space station. Um, we practiced failures and throwing switches and running procedures and checklists uh, to do that. Um, but, you know, our spacewalkers, uh, there's no place to really practice. There's, I mean, if there's no place that's no, you know, microgravity on the surface of the earth, but the closest we can get is in a really large pool. Uh, it's about 40 feet deep. And we put a mock-up of the space station in it. And so our space, well, everybody has to get scuba certified. And the spacewalkers put on a water, um, like a version of the spacesuit that's set up to operate in water. And um, then you put weights and you fill the suit with air and you get yourself to be neutrally buoyant, which means you're neither floating to the top of the pool or sinking to the bottom. And that's about as close as we can 
get to practice for a spacewalk is in this neutral buoyancy lab, which is just a giant pool, and you can practice uh, spacewalking. I always liked the water part of it. Um, you know, they taught us to, to scuba dive, and that was, that was really fun. Um, I learned to drive an armored personnel carrier, which was part of the evacuation of the shuttle. Should something bad happen on the pad, you would run out to a basket, uh, slap a paddle, go racing down to the ground in this basket, and then run, run, run over to a bunker. And if they said it was safe to do so, then the entire crew, this is all suited up in your pressure suit, would go and in my big pressure suit, I had to drive the armored personnel carrier. <laughs> so um, uh, a lot of very interesting and unusual things you get to do, but how fun is that? I think probably one of the things I'm most proud of is the IMAX uh, 3D space station movie. Uh, they taught me how to operate the IMAX camera to take film and taught me how to, this very expensive film, to take movies in space. And uh, I can tell you, I just really almost burst with pride. At the very end, all the astronauts who did the filming show up as, uh, as uh, photographers. So I like that. So another question from Shirayan Zurajula. Um, how scared were you the first time you went into space? Yeah, I think most people actually, um, you know, if you want to be an astronaut, it's, it's hard work to get there. You know, you, it's pretty competitive. And, um, and so you have to really want to be an astronaut. It's not something you just sort of decide, maybe I'll apply next week. And, uh, and so I think for most people, what they're most afraid about when they uh, got onto the rocket was just that they would make a mistake and not be worthy of, you know, they would not do right by their crew. They would make a mistake on this very important and uh, difficult program. Um, I would say on the second time, I went to fly, I began to understand, I saw a lot more clearly um, how dangerous it was. And, um, and so I think the conclusion that I came to is probably the same one that I came to when I was a test pilot, because people do ask test pilots the same things. And um, Lisa probably has an opinion on this too, but uh, generally I think our families recognize we wouldn't be who we were if we weren't following this thing that we're really passionate about and we care about. And so if your family supports you and says, look, you know, you just, you wouldn't be you if you didn't want to go do this. So of course they support you. Um, you know, you're, I think I was more worried for my family than I was for me. That's a general theme that I hear that there is no fear on your, on your part. I like that, that there truly is not that same gripping fear that the rest of us get when we look out, you know, a plane window. <laughs> Thank you. All, you know. I, can't, I don't even know how to land our own plane. I'm so scared. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, but Pam, thank you so much for taking your time to talk to our kids in our program. They, I'm so proud of them. They have been such great, dedicated over, this has been a, a seven full week program and they have stuck with it and especially during these times so i do have one last question that i like to ask everybody mm -hmm. in general when you have a goal what is the one thing the one piece of advice that you would give to our students in pursuing that goal and reaching that goal don't quit don't quit um there's lots of people who have opinions about, well, you need to do this, you need to do that. Um, talk to people, ask them questions, ask test pilots how they became test pilots, ask astronauts how they became astronauts, ask um, you know, engineers how they became engineers or how they decided what they were going to do. And they can give you some good advice, but you know, I think the world is, it continues to change and evolve. And um, there are some people who think that, uh, you know, 
maybe if you didn't study this this one major that you can't do something and it's just not true and um you know i i found sometimes as a woman people thought that i shouldn't be a pilot i mean they actually told me that and uh it would have been easy to quit um but i didn't i didn't think about what they said i listened to what they said if it was good advice i took it if it wasn't good advice then i didn't take it but the only person who can stop you from achieving what you want to achieve is actually you it's you quitting um you you just you there's always a way so just don't quit oh, thank you pam that's that's great we've heard that from our other we've had so many great stories from our test pilots and our astronauts who have said the same exact thing where they've they've encountered roadblocks and people that have told them no and all and also being rejected from programs and yep. they don't stop trying so i think that's a right. really important lesson for all of our all of our students and i appreciate so much your time i know you have to go so i am going to stop recording and then hope i can edit this a little bit better to give a better ending <laughs>